And welcome to the first of our webinar series on succeeding with SBIR. My name is Phil Spesser. I'm the founder of Foresight Science and Technology. Um, Foresight has a, and I personally have a long history with SBIR. Back when I was a young pup, uh, I was the person who authored the bill and was the lead lobbyist on it on behalf of the Federation of American Scientists. When we started SBIR uh, at FAS, uh, working on a bill that had been previously introduced um, and refining it, we were concerned with how we improve the ability of small companies to innovate, and a key aspect of that was partnering with universities. In fact, SBIR will be thought of as one of the original GAP funding programs in the United States, and that was certainly the intention of, uh, of the people who were involved in enacting the bill was finding a way to accelerate the movement of university technology as well as small company technology into the marketplace. I'm very pleased that our speaker today is Peter Atherton from the National Science Foundation. For those of you not familiar with the history, history of SBIR, the first program, long before there was legislation, was at the National Science Foundation. SBIR was invented by a gentleman named Roland Tibbetts, who ended up as an SBIR program manager at the NSF. Peter joined NSF in 2013. Prior to that, he was at a company, McCall Corporation, yeah. he founded. And so Peter brings experience uh, not only working in the government, but also being in the private sector and understanding what it's like to work well, in a small R&D company. You're, you're then I'm going to move over to Peter. On this webinar, but we're, what we'll have to do is, is, is discuss that. And you're going to have some people s uh, Saturday that you can talk to. They'll be, John will be a good one to talk to as well as... Uh, hey, if you're as not well as, uh, our speaker, right, can you mute yourself, start please? Start kind of casting your new net, if you will. <laughs> His name's John Johnson. Um, somebody's on here and needs to mute themselves. So um, if you're not Peter, please mute yourself. And with this, I'm going to turn the program over to Peter and mute myself. Thank you. OK, thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. I presume you can hear me clearly? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so, Chris, if you could just move on to the first of my slides, that would be great. Okay, and maybe on to the next one. Great, thank you. So, um, uh, thanks, Phil, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, most of you probably won't be all that familiar with the fact that the National Science Foundation uh, does actually fund commercialization work. As Phil said, the SBIR program, the Small Business Small Business Innovation Research Program was actually developed originally or implemented originally at the National Science Foundation. And it's a little different from what the NSF normally does. 98% of the NSF's funding goes to funding pure research in this country, but roughly 2% of it goes to funding small companies, um, startup companies, and early stage companies. And the purpose of that funding is to help them to develop leading edge uh, technology-based innovations. <clears throat> so what I want to do in the next 15 minutes or so is just talk a little bit about the SBIR program. As Phil said, I'm a program director here. I happen to manage the information technologies topic. Um, my background originally is technical. I have a PhD in physics, for example, and I spent several years in R&D. But I also spent over 20 years actually involved in early stage and startup companies and started a company of my own which went public, and it's a long story anyway. But but suffice it to say that I and I think all the other program directors here um, have uh, industry and or startup experience. And so the program is very, very commercially focused. And the people who actually run, you know, do the nuts and bolts as far as the program is concerned are also people who have been through the process and so they understand the sorts of things that startups and early stage companies have to deal with. <clears throat> so with that background, let me just kick off by talking a little bit about the objectives of the program. And on this slide here, you can see uh, some key points. So the pur purpose of the program, the SBIR and STTR program, 
and I'll, I'll come back later to the difference between those two programs, but they're really you know, two sides of the same coin. The purpose of the program is to nurture high impact tech innovations, and we do that by providing, uh, re really it's pre-seed funding for startup companies and early stage high tech companies. <clears throat> now the, the program has been around for several decades, so it's got a reasonable history. And it has funded a number of companies that have gone on to be very successful and very widely known. And two companies that we often um, we often refer to are Qualcomm and Symantec. Both of those companies were SBI. Okay, so let me just continue. So uh, Qualcomm and Symantec were SBIR grant recipients in the very earliest stages of those companies' existence. And so obviously they went on to do great things. But there have been many companies that have gone through the program here that have gone on to be very successful and have made a sig sig really significant difference in society. So one of the things about our program is that we provide grants, not contracts. And the reason I make that distinction is because uh, in fact, most of the SBIR programs in the federal government are all about providing contracts to do specific work. In our case, we don't provide contracts. We offer grants, and so they're effectively equity-free investment. And we don't tell our companies what they need to do. They tell us what they want to do, and we decide whether we think it's worth funding. So we have a very strong focus on commercialization in this program. I mean, if there's one message you should take away from this, it's, it, it is that, that we are very strongly focused on commercialization. And one way to look at the program is that our funding is useful in that it de-risks early stage technologies for other investors, later investors such as, such as angel investors or VCs. And the point there is that most of these investors are actually very technically risk averse because they really don't, generally speaking, don't understand how to assess technical risk and better at assessing market risk and technical risk. And so our, our uh, program can be regarded as a means by which very early stage companies uh, with interesting innovations that have commercial potential can de-risk those innovations for investors. Uh, can we give, go to the next slide? Chris, could we go to the next slide? Great, thank you. Okay, so this, yeah, this, this slide is intended to uh, graphically represent the way the program works. And I'll just walk uh, quickly through it. So we have uh, two phases of funding for companies that come through our program, uh, phase one and phase two, obviously. And companies uh, have to enter the program by applying for a phase one award, uh, SBIR or STTR award. And the purpose of phase one funding for a company is to establish technical feasibility of an innovation that they've presented that they want to develop. So they establish technical feasibility, but it's in a commercial setting. It's not in a vacuum. It needs to be in a commercial setting. So when a company submits a proposal uh, to apply for phase one funding, they need to obviously describe the innovation, but they need to also describe the market opportunity, the value proposition, et cetera, et cetera, associated with that innovation. So establishing te technical feasibility in a commercial context is really the objective of phase one. Funding for phase one is up to $225,000 over somewhere between six and 12 months. And it, it, the reason I say six to 12 months is that the company nominates the time frame for the phase one project, but it's in that range, six to 12 months. And companies that successfully undertake their phase one research can then apply for phase two funding, which is essentially for what I would call pre-commercialization development. So it's continuing on with development of the innovation that was established uh, in phase one, but it's doing things to, such as uh, working towards um, uh, pilot programs, building prototypes and things of that nature, the sorts of things you would have to do in order to bring an innovation to the point that it can be commercialized. So phase two funding is for a larger amount of money. It's for up to $750,000 nominally over two years. Uh, some, some companies accelerate the program, but it's nominally for over two years. Um, and during phase two, there are a number of supplements that companies can apply for. And I won't go through all of them. There are quite a few. But 
most of them are designed to encourage companies to do things that are relevant to their commercialization. So, for example, the largest of the phase two supplements that companies can apply for is what we call our phase two B supplement. And in this in this supplement, we will match uh, 50 cents in the dollar um, sales re either sales revenue or investment funding that the company can bring in uh, during either phase one or phase two, which is a direct consequence of the work being in phase two. So if the company's doing something else as well and they bring in money for that, that doesn't count. But if they're totally focused, for example, on the work that they did during phase one and then uh, focused on during phase two, then they bring in investment money for that or they make some sales and they can aggregate those, those, uh, those two amounts, then we will match that 50 cents in the dollar up to a maximum match of half a million dollars. So it's a significant supplement. Um, and a company that exits, so we, in our case, we do not have a funded phase three. A number of the other government, federal government programs have a funded, funded phase three, um, but we do not. For us, phase three is the company then going out, exiting phase two and going out into the world, um, you know, selling products or services, employing people, paying taxes, and generally being successful. So we don't have a funded phase three, but companies that go through phase one and phase two and take advantage of most of the supplements will exit the program having received roughly, uh, just roughly $1.5 million. So, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but on the other hand, to a startup company, it is a huge amount of money and it makes a massive difference if it's applied at the right stage of the company's um, uh, growth. So that's, in, a, in essence, that's the way the program is structured. And as I said before, this money is all equity-free. We don't ask for anything in return. These are awards that are made to companies. We simply want to stimulate uh, innovation and the growth of commercially successful entities based on those innovations. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So another way to look at this um, is to consider this, uh, and you've probably all seen this, this infamous valley of death uh, diagram you know, where you look at uh, innovations that are emerging from research where they have a good deal of resources applied to them and they have to get across this gap where there's re relatively little, usually relatively little in the way of resources available uh, until they get to the point where investors um, become interested in investing in the company and, and industry partners might also become interested in investing. So our money, if you look at these, uh, these red um, uh, lines at the top, phase one, phase two and supplements, our money is intended to help companies bridge that gap, get across that so-called valley of death uh, for innovations that are emerging from research um, but need to, you know, need to make it through to the point where uh, serious investors can get involved uh, and help the company grow further. So that's really, ideally, that's where we like to position our funding. The phase one funding should be applied to innovations where there's been some research done but they're well short of being even a minimum viable product. And phase two will carry on from where phase one left off and turn uh, you know, an innovation, a proof of concept, if you like, into something which looks like a, a saleable product or service. <clears throat> and then uh, the company, as I said before, can take advantage of further supplements to carry them further forward uh, towards commercialization. And you know what you see with our program, we have a number of different topics, and I'll come to this later, but what you see with our program is that companies that uh, come through the faster moving topics such as information technologies, which as I mentioned is the topic that I manage. Um, most of these companies, by the time they get into phase two, they're already raising money and they're already, generally speaking, selling early products or, or early services. And so by the time they exit uh, phase two with the supplements, they're, gener they're generally on a pretty solid footing. Um, other companies that operate in other topic areas, such as um, manufacturing, for example, where the cycle times tend to be longer, still by the end of phase two, with perhaps a phase two B supplement, still ought to be able to get to the point where they can attract investors by the time they exit our program. And that's the objective of the program, to help nurture these early stage innovations. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. So let me say a few words about what we like to fund. This is a, actually a very important point. So our, the SBIR STTR program here uh, likes to fund high technical risk innovations that have the potential for really substantial commercial returns. So in essence, we're, we're, we like to fund moonshots, if you like. 
and we don't mind if there's a significant technical risk. In fact, that's really the that's really the objective of the program. We like to look for these interesting innovations that have a good deal of technical risk still associated with them, but if it, but if it all comes off, they have the potential to make a significant difference, to be very commercially successful, and hopefully also to make a positive societal impact. Now, I'll just say a word about this. Societal impact is important, and we do take it into account, but it's a secondary consideration. The primary consideration is whether or not the innovation is likely, whether the, the team can build a successful company around the innovation that they're proposing. Because you know, I mean, if you're not commercially successful, you'll make no societal impact whatsoever. So, commercial—the potential for commercial success—is is the first and foremost consideration. Um, positive societal impact, though, of course, is a plus. Definitely, it is a plus. Uh, in terms of what our money can be used for, it can only be used for R&D activities. So, companies, early, even early stage companies, have to do other things: sales and marketing, customer discovery, patent protection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have to do all those things, but you need to find other sources of money for those types of activities. Our money, by legislation, our money can only be used for R&D activities and indirect costs that are, are uh, supportive of those R&D activities. As I mentioned, we have a very we have a very strong focus on commercialization, and because we like to apply to apply the, you know the public money where it makes most difference, our focus therefore is on startup companies and early stage companies. And there are some stats here from 2014. They're a year out of date, but if anything, these statistics have sharpened up even further in the last 12 months. And so let me just run through these quickly. So 72 in in 2014, 72 percent of the companies that we funded were less than five years old. 90 percent of them had less than fewer than 10 employees, and many of them had just one or two employees. So there's nothing wrong with even being one person. And 80 percent of these co uh, companies that we funded back in 2014 had not received a prior phase two award from the federal government. And that's an important point. So uh, we tend, so if, you, if you look at all you know, these statistics together, you can see that the picture is very clear. We tend to fund startup or early stage companies which are small and which are not, uh, have not been living off government contracts uh, you know, for the last number of years. So that's a typical profile of a uh, company that we would fund at phase one. Uh, could we move to the next slide, please, please? <clears throat> That's it. So let me say a few words about what we don't like to fund, because uh, this is equally important. So we don't fund in the SBI STTR program. We don't fund basic research. I mean, from NSF's point of view, the other 98% of NSF funds basic research. We don't fund that. And we don't fund proposals that look as though they're really researchers, you know, presenting an SBI uh, proposal, but really all they want to do is further research. We are we are serious about commercialization, and we try and sniff out not just the ideas, the innovations, but also the teams who are serious about commercializing those innovations. We also don't like to fund projects that lack technical risk or lack uh, significant innovation. In fact, we generally don't fund those proposals. We also don't like to fund proposals that are based on an incremental improvement to an existing product or service. Occasionally there are exceptions to this, but by and large, you know, companies that have a red widget and want to make a green widget, we are generally not the place to come for funding. We also don't, don't like to fund, and we won't fund, uh, proposals where we don't think there's a strong chance of commercial success. And this, this, this is a function not only of the innovation itself. In other words, you know, you look at the market opportunities, IP protection, value proposition, all the things that you would look at to assess whether an innovation is likely to have a significant, um, uh, likely to lead to significant commercial success. It's not just that. We also look at the team, the company and the team. I mean, if there's one thing I've learned in more than 20 years as an entrepreneur, it is that people are everything in this game. So, you know, a great team can take an ordinary idea and turn it into a screaming success. And similarly, a bad team can take a great idea and kill it. So people are crucially important, and we do our best to try and understand what the team is like and whether we think they're appropriate to take this, and whether they're really driven to take this forward. Uh, we also don't like to fund projects if our funding is not likely to make a big difference. So for example, if we have a choice, and this never happens, this is purely hypothetical, but if, for example, we were to have you know, two proposals 
each with uh, interesting innovations, high technical risk, potential for significant commercial uh, return. One of those was submitted by a brand new company that was formed a month, let's say a month before they submitted the proposal, they got no resources, and the other is submitted by a much larger company that could easily fund this themselves. If we have to make a choice in that case, we will probably fund the company, that the early startup that has no resources, because our money will make a huge difference to that company. It could make a difference between you know, surviving and not surviving. So we like to apply the money to high-risk innovations where our funding will make a big difference. Um, <clears throat> and finally, of course, and I mentioned this earlier, so I won't dwell on it, our money can only be used for R&D, so it can't be used for sales and marketing, customer discovery and things like that. To do those sorts of activities, and they're crucially important, of course, but to do those sorts of activities, you will need early-stage companies, the companies that we fund, will need to find funding beyond NSF. And I think that's actually entirely appropriate because early stage companies have to get used to raising money, either making money or raising money, and usually it's both. So I think that's entirely appropriate. Now, can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, so I want to say a few words about the differences between uh, NSF's SBIR program, and I'm including the STTR program in this. They're you know, essentially, they're similar, very, very similar in terms of the review criteria. They're exactly the same. So I want to say a few words about what's different about our program. So first of all, we don't buy anything from the companies that we award. And the reason that's important is because most SBIR programs, not all, but most SBI programs, uh, are, which means that the funding uh, you know, provides by the contract to the company, which the agency then wants to purchase. EOD is a perfect example of that. And it's a perfectly valid business model, it just isn't. So we don't buy anything from our grant, and the corollary to that is that, you know, we companies, where to focus in terms of innovations that they're proposing to us. So it's up to the company to propose an to to try and convince an NSF uh, review panel that this, this innovation has a much strong value proposition and the team knows how to take it for commercial success. So proposing companies to do, do that. We don't tell you what solicitation. Um, uh, I think it's now 10 topics and they're listed through them in detail. They're listed here topics. If you actually read you'll see that the Topics are not meant to be, they're meant to be um, inclusive and, you know, we provide a, a topic description that must be appropriate to that, that topic. Not, it, it, those are not limited. So, you know, basically propose uh, an innovation in pretty much any area um, and we will find a, a home for it. There are only a few caveats that we do not fund drug development, NIH funds. There are a couple of carve-outs like that, but um, if you put those to one side, we will fund uh, an innovation that meets our criteria in almost any technology space, and we'll fit it into one of these topics. And so the key point here is that fitting with a topic is actually much, much less important than, than you know, adhering to the, uh, the requirements of the solicitation in terms of the sort of spirit underlying the solicitation. So again, and I can't say it often enough, we look to fund uh, high technical risk innovations with the potential for substantial commercial return and hopefully also positive societal impact. So if we could go to the next slide, please. please. Okay, so I just want to uh, say a couple of words about the logistics underlying the program. So. Uh, all proposals that are submitted to NSF's SBIR program, SBIR STTR program, must be submitted in response to a solicitation. We do not accept unsolicited proposals. So we run two funding cycles per year. Uh, so we, uh, for example, we have just released, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we released uh, the latest SBIR and STTR solicitations, and they have submission deadlines in mid-June. So we run two cycles per year. Um, submission deadlines are in June at the present time, and the second cycle this year will have submission deadlines in December. 
when the proposals are submitted, um, and just to give you a picture of this, so we have um, roughly, and this is, these are rough numbers, but we have roughly 1,200 proposals submitted every cycle, every six months. Some number of those, sort of 100-ish, uh, will be returned without review because the proposals are seriously deficient, they're missing complete sections, or there's something really wrong with them. The rest of them, say 1,100 or so, will then go to panels, they'll go to review panels. And they'll be divided up according to the topics. And of course, when you submit them, you would nominate a topic and a subtopic. But if we think it's the wrong fit, we'll just move it to another subtopic. So those will be divided up into panels, where a panel will be focused on a particular subtopic area. And all of these proposals will then be reviewed by a panel of experts. And typically at phase one, the panels, generally speaking, are more heavily populated with technical people. Um, Panels at phase two tend to be populated roughly 50% with technical people and roughly 50% with commercial experts. But at phase one, it's mostly, it's not exclusively, but mostly technical reviewers. They will review the proposals. They'll make a recommendation as far as funding is concerned. And that recommendation is advisory to the relevant program director. Um, and then there'll be further diligence after the panel. You know, there'll be some to and fro with the company, for example, there might be some further investigations into the background of the company or into the, the history of the people involved in the company, things of that nature. Um, and then companies that are going to receive an award will learn of that uh, typically four to five months after the submission deadline. And funding for phase one begins uh, six months, roughly six months after the submission deadline. Now the review process involves two broad review criteria. The first is what we call intellectual merit, which is uh, pretty much what you would expect it to be. Um, the second is the, what we call commercial and societal impacts. So the commercial considerations are the most important considerations here. And as I said before, what the review panels, even at phase one, even for the first proposal that you submit when the idea is still very nascent, needs to be developed and needs to be proven, you still need to put that innovation in a commercial context. So you need to talk about you know, uh, what is the market opportunity for the technology, what's the value proposition. Um, you need to talk about a commercialization model, make some revenue estimates, which of course will be wrong, but at least it gives the panel an idea of, you know, the way the team is thinking. You need to talk about things like intellectual property protection strategy, all the sorts of things that you would need to consider uh, in, in trying to build a company around an innovation. So that's the commercial considerations. And then of course societal impacts, as I said before, <clears throat> Excuse me. We do look at societal impacts, but it's a secondary consideration to the commercial potential. If there's no commercial potential, as I said before, you won't make any societal difference at all. Uh, so we first and foremost look at the commercial potential. But you know, we have funded, for example, companies which may have a slightly less um, uh, their commercial potential may be slightly less than some of the other companies that we fund. But we might have decided to fund them because we think that the societal impact will be particularly strong positive societal impact will be particularly strong. So in some, you know, we do take that into account, but um, as I said before, uh, the commercial viability of the innovation and of the team, the company, uh, is the first and foremost consideration. So that's a few words on the logistics. I said I would talk a little bit about SBIR versus STTR. So um, the two programs are basically the same, and just to let you know, SBIR and STTR proposals are, are reviewed together on the same panel. So if they're, if they're in the same technology space, they will be reviewed together according to exactly the same review criteria. The only difference between the two really is that in the case of an SBIR proposal, um, two thirds at phase one, two thirds of the award money must be spent within the company or by the company to do with its own research and development and no more than one third spent externally on, for example, consultants or subcontractors. In the case of STTR, the per, and STTR you know, stands for Technology Transfer. Um, the TT stands for Technology Transfer. So the, the purpose of the STTR program was really to try and stimulate transfer of technology out of uh, not-for-profit research institutions, which mainly means universities. And so in the case of an STTR award, there's an obligation at phase one for at least 40% of the money to be spent with the company, at least 30% to be spent uh, on a sub-award to a university or not-for-profit research institution, and the remaining 30% can go either way. So you can actually spend quite a lot of money 
in the case of an STTR, you can spend quite a lot of money on a subaward to a university. And I often get asked, you know, well, should I? Is there any benefit to doing an STTR versus an SBIR? And you know, are they reviewed preferentially? Uh, why sh should I pick this one or that one? And really, the short answer is, it's your decision, and it's a business decision. It's purely a business decision. There are no, there's no benefit to selecting one over the other. You, you need anyone, anyone who's proposing to this program, should select the uh, the vehicle SBIR or STTR that they think makes the most sense for their business. So if you need, for example, to access um, not just intellectual property that, that's uh, coming out of a university, but also some of the expertise at the university to really complete your technical team, you may decide, for instance, that you want to go the STTR route. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of uh, companies find that dealing with universities can be a little bit, a little bit slower, and it can sometimes be a little bit expensive and so they prefer to take the SBIR out. So it's really a business decision on the part of the proposing company. And, um, you know, as I said, there's no preferential treatment given to either one or the other approach. So I think, um, I think that's it. If you go to the next slide, please, Chris. So this slide has my um, email address on it. Uh, if anyone has, you're welcome to ask questions now, of course, but if anyone has any further questions, Please don't hesitate to email me, and I'll be happy to either speak with you by phone or just you know, respond to you by email. Now, the best thing to do if you're interested in submitting a proposal uh, to our program, and we do have open solicitations at the moment, so now is a good time if you're interested to at least find out more about the program. So first thing is read the solicitations on our website, and you see the web address at the bottom of each of these slides. That's where you go to, to get access to the uh, solicitations. And, there's a ton of other information there too. There's some webinars and a lot of other information about um, the program itself, uh, and different aspects of it and how to apply and so forth. But the best thing to do if you're interested in applying is to send me a brief email, just one to two page email or attachment with an executive summary regarding the innovation that you're interested in uh, seeking funding for. So. Um, address things like, you know, what is the innovation, obviously, what's the market opportunity, you know, the value proposition, what's your commercialization approach, um, give a brief description of the team, all the sorts of things that you think would be relevant to somebody who's just looking to see what is this, who's the team, and what's the market opportunity and the commercialization opportunity here. So send me, if you're interested, please send me a, a, a brief executive summary. I'll be happy to give you my thoughts, and if we need to follow up uh, with further email or a quick phone conversation, we can do that too. So with that, I think I'm finished. That was really just an overview. There's a lot of other things that we could go into, but um, hopefully that's given you a flavor uh, of the SPIR, STTR program here at NSF. Thank you, Peter. We have a couple of questions. I'm going to kick it off with a, a question, then we'll go to Bill Linden's question. Uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, there has been a lot of discussion at the Association of University Technology Managers list server and at the meeting about SBIR as people look for gap funding uh, and think about, and there's more pressure to be an entrepreneurial university, meaning spin-out companies make economic impact. Typically, uh, when universities spin out companies, they take an equity stake in the company. Um, I know when I was running the University of Rhode Island, we used to take a 5% equity stake in our spin outs together with a license. So I'd like you to address briefly how big a stake a university can have in a spin out company and have it still qualify for an SPIR and whether university involvement as equity owners versus just a licensor makes any difference to the review panels. Okay. Um, so thanks for that question, Phil. So in terms of the does it make any difference, it doesn't really make any difference to the review process unless the university is, is um, you know, is, is either seeking or has already obtained an outrageous equity position in the company. So, and in terms of your first question, you know, what is reasonable? I mean, it, I can't give you a definitive answer, but I've seen, for example, you mentioned 5%. That's not uncommon. I've seen somewhat higher than that. I've seen somewhat lower than that. But, I mean, typically I would see somewhere in the zero to, 
you know, 10 percent range. I have seen one example of a university taking a substantially higher equity position than that, and that did draw some negative comments in the panel review. Uh, I, ultimately, I don't think it made any difference to the decision, but um, it certainly drew the attention of the reviewers. But as long as the equity stake is, and also the royalty rates, are reasonable, and generally speaking, in my experience, they are. Um, and I think there's more. This is becoming more normalised too, as you say. More universities are being pressured to, you know, to try and um, uh, promote uh, spin-off activities, commercial activities. So I think there's more sort of normalisation of these numbers, the royalty rates and the equity stakes. Um, as long as those numbers are reasonable, uh, then we don't have a problem with it. And generally speaking, reviewers won't really mind at all that there's a uh, university involved. In fact. You know, sometimes it's actually uh, beneficial because it sort of locks the university in maybe for future uh, technology development activities as well. Good. Bill Linden asks, uh, what are the differences in the award rates, you know, who percentage of winners for SBIR versus STTR? Um, I think, well, first of all, we get more SBIR proposals than STTR by a ratio of about Ooh. 9 to 1. Uh, so the statistics for the STTR are a bit weaker just because the numbers are lower. But uh, I'm not, a, I'm, as far as I'm aware, the award rates are basically the same. And they ought to be the same because the review criteria are the same. So you know, we don't look at the two types of proposal any differently. We review them from the point of view of you know, the innovation and the commercial potential. Um, so as far as I know, the award rates are basically the same for the two different categories of proposal. And as I said before, they're, they are, they're mixed in when it comes to the award, the uh, review process as well. So if you have uh, you know, a number of SBIR and a number of STTR proposals all in the same uh, uh, technical subspecialty, they will probably all go on the same panel and be reviewed by the same set of reviewers according to exactly the same review criteria. Uh, Christopher Kaufman asks, what is the NSF stance on convertible debt from venture capital funding, especially mm -hmm. when transitioning to a phase two award? Well, um, I mean, we don't have any philosophical issues with convertible debt. Having said that, um, if, for example, you were a phase two company who wanted to apply for a phase two B supplement and you, and you wanted to use um, investment funds as a justification for that and it was convertible debt, we would not allow you to do that until that debt had converted. And the reason for that is that we don't, the only investment money that we will allow to be counted is money that is irrevocably invested in the company. So if there's a debt component to it, then we won't allow it to be counted until it has converted and the debt component, the, the debt obligation, potential debt obligation goes away. So one thing I tell all my companies is that if they're looking to raise money and they want to use that investment as the basis for a supplement, which of course they should, then what they should do is either do a priced round, uh, so it's just a pure equity investment, or if it's an unpriced round, try and do it as convertible equity, not convertible debt, such as, for example, via a SAFE agreement, a SAFE agreement. And you know that's what I'm finding, my experience anyway, my observation, is that that generally is, um, is perfectly acceptable to early investors because they're not investing in the hope that they'll get the money back because you know the company collapses and pays them back the money. They're investing you know, because they hope the company does well. So, and they like to see that, that the company leverages their investment through getting a supplement from us. So, and they can't do that if it's convertible debt. So I've had a number of companies who've come to me and in, in some cases, in fact, they've already agreed uh, the terms of the convertible uh, debt arrangement a convertible note, and I've said to them, look, if you can unwind that and can, and and you know have them uh, invest in the form of convertible equity, please do it. And in all cases, the investors have been happy to do it because it doesn't really make much difference to them, and they get the benefit of the company also being able to obtain a supplement through us. So short answer is we don't have any fundamental objection to convertible debt, but it's in the company's interest if they're looking to use that as a basis for supplements, it's in the company's interest uh, to make it convertible equity. 
And the next question is, um, what happens when a faculty member makes an invention and takes a leave of absence to go with an SBIR company with the intention of returning to the university? Is it permissible for them no. to be the PI under a leave of absence? Yes, it is. Yeah, that happens not infrequently. Um, the PI on, on an SBIR or an STTR award must be primarily employed by the company. Therefore, if they really want to be PI, they have they do have to take a leave of absence and join the company. But it's not uncommon for academics to do that. You know, take a sabbatical, for example, or a leave of absence, um, join the company, uh, maybe through phase one, and then if all goes well, um, by the time they get to phase two, or in the gap between phase one and phase two, um, they might have enough money to hire a CEO or you know hire. Uh, some other staff anyway, someone who can take over as PI and someone who can uh, take over, basically take over the running of the company and then they go back to academia. That has happened many times and you know as long as it's handled properly it's a perfectly successful and perfectly acceptable model from our point of view. What we don't, what doesn't work and in fact is, is usually non-compliant with our requirements anyway <clears throat> is academics who try to be both the PI at the company and also maintain some kind of academic position. It generally doesn't work because the way the deal is structured with the university, they can't be primarily employed by the company. And in any case, they've got their foot in two camps and you know, trying to grow an early stage company requires 150% focus and effort and you just can't do it part time. But the, the, the approach that you're suggesting by taking a leave of absence is perfectly accept acceptable and uh, a lot of companies do that. That's one of the you know, there are several models that we see, if you like, and that's one of the models that I have seen work uh, work quite well, actually. Terrific. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be our first presenter in this series, Peter. I'd like to thank everybody who logged in to uh, listen to the webinar, and we will be having another one next month, and we'll be sending out information shortly on that. Uh, which agency is that, Chris? Next month. Chris is drawing a blank <laughs> while he's running the computers in the background. So anyways, we'll have it out to you shortly. Thank you very much once again, and everybody have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.